Hi everyone, welcome to this afternoon's session. Welcome to those people that are already in the room. Um, today we have Eric Walters, who's a high school science teacher from New York City. Uh, he presented a fantastic session this morning and he's following that up with a session on science and social justice, the perfect combination. Uh, it, I, it looks like it's going to be a fantastic session, so I'm really excited. Uh, once again, a special thank you to our sponsors and supporters. Thanks to Steve Hargadon and the Learning Revolution Project, as well as the volunteers from the Australia E-Series. Uh, we've been putting in a lot of work to get this ready in, in the last few weeks, so thank you to everyone for your help. Special thank you to Cyber Academy for sponsoring us, and as always to Coach Carol and Shambles Guru for supporting us in the background. Big thank you. Okay, so welcome Gary, you've just popped in at the right time. If you'd like to grab your pointer tool and just grab one of the little icons and put it in your part of the world. I'm over here on the east coast of Australia, in northern New South Wales. So we've got Gary in New York. And Carol's down in Victoria. Lucy's in the state somewhere, I think, and so is Peggy. Welcome, Antoinette. Okay, we're just putting our icons on the board. Okay, must be a bit slow there today. All right, so that brings us to our presentation with Eric. And I'm sure you'll thoroughly enjoy this. So thank you so much, Eric. Take it away. Okay, thank you, Ness. Uh, thank you for moderating my session once again. Um, my name is Eric Walters. I'm the Director of Technology at the Marymount School of New York. We are a pre-K through 12 independent all-girls school in Manhattan. And again, it's really great to be participating um, in this conference, uh, mainly because this is an opportunity for me to share some of the work that my students have done. And um, when I told them that they were going to be uh, featured in a presentation in Australia, um, they were quite thrilled. And they actually thought I was going to Australia, and I hated to disappoint them. So what we're going to talk about today is um, looking at a combination of science curriculum and social justice and looking at how those two uh, disciplines intersect. So we're going to start with sort of an understanding about what kind of learning experiences students should have and why science and social justice is a perfect combination for our students. A lot of us, when we talk about our curriculum, we want our students to have experiences that are authentic and relevant. We want there to be some inherent meaning in what the students are learning. If they don't have that, then um, there's no real world connection for them. So we also want the, their learning experiences to be engaging. Um, we want the students to be personally invested in what they're doing. And we really want, when we're looking at science and social justice, we want their learning experiences to be personally transformative for the students. We want the students to end up in a place that they never thought that they would imagine. On top of that, we really want the students to do something that's globally transformative. Um, if we can get to that level, then I think we're doing something right. Um, not every science and social justice experience is going to be globally transformative. It may be locally transformative, and there's some power to that as well. So I want to give you sort of a context as to why this has evolved uh, in our school specifically. If we quote, um, our school is part of an international network of schools. And if we uh, quote the founder of our school, she said that the aims of a Marymount education are manifold. We want to educate our students' hearts and minds, and we want to provide for each student's total growth intellectually, spiritually, socially, and physically. So that sort of is an undercurrent for all of our curriculum and all of our curriculum development in our school whether it's in history, English, uh, world languages, science, mathematics. Um, the students know this. They know this quote, and they pretty much recite it word for word. If we look at our school's mission statement, 
Um, we're an independent Catholic day school. We want our students to question, risk, and grow. We want our students to care, serve, and lead. And we want to produce young women who are prepared to challenge, shape, and change the world. So being a Catholic school, um, religious studies and ethical studies are an important part of the, consider, uh, of the curriculum. But it doesn't end at the religious studies door. We're all expected and we're all uh, challenged uh, to find ways in our own individual disciplines for our students to challenge, shape, and change the world. So that undercurrent is a very powerful one, and it's one that all of our students are aware of. So that when we talk about innovative projects such as science and social justice, it's not something that's unfamiliar to them. To give you a little context about support for social justice, I've included um, just four projects that we've done um, really from seventh grade up. I, if I wanted to, I could have found projects really from pre-K and nursery all the way up to 12th grade, but I just decided to highlight a few. Last year, our seventh graders uh, worked on a project for Zimbabwe, and we have a sister school, a uh, series of sister schools in Zimbabwe. And if you know anything about the economic and political situation in Zimbabwe over the past few years, it's been very challenging there. But we have members of the religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary. Um, some of our sisters are working there, you know, um, on the ground. So our seventh graders designed a project. They were just empowered to say, we'd really like you as students to come up with a project that you think would benefit the students in Zimbabwe. So what they decided on after doing some research was that they wanted to design and produce um, jar lamps, solar powered jar lamps for local libraries. Because one of the things that they quickly determined there was that at night, when students wanted to study, there was no lights available for them in the library. So they were required to think about how to design these solar powered jar lamps. They had to do some circuit work. Um, they designed the circuits. And then we had the circuits produced. Um, and then the students put together approximately 200 solar jar lamp kits that were shipped off to Zimbabwe last spring. Um, and our sisters that are on the ground there were just thrilled to be able to have these, and the students were as well. So as we move into eighth grade physical science, they do a lot of work on alternative energies, and they're just completing a project now about um, alternative energy sources, both in the United States and also in Zimbabwe. In our 10th grade class, um, in our social justice class in 10th grade, we've been participating in something called the Youth Philanthropy Initiative for the last about four or five years, um, where the students do research um, on local nonprofit organizations, and then they have to do a pitch um, to a group of judges for gaining money to support that organization. And so it requires them to do some research. It requires them to uh, visit the nonprofit. It requires them to talk to the nonprofit um, customers and clientele and determine what their needs are. And during that presentation process, the a uh, group with the best presentation, their nonprofit receives a $5,000 grant from YPI. They then move on to um, a series of presentations at um, the Bank of New York, where in the past the winning, uh, winning presentation has received a grant of $25,000 for their uh, nonprofit organization. So one of the things that is really important in building a connection between science and social justice is that this connection has been going on for the students and it's been building since uh, elementary school. So that when you start to talk about weaving social justice into a science curriculum, it's not something that's uh, not foreign to them. So those are the kind of things we've been thinking about, and we're going to talk tonight about two projects that my students have done. We're also very fortunate that um, the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, um, had, they're an NG, registered NGO at the United Nations. So that gives us a lot of interesting connections um, at the United Nations um, in terms of the Millennium Development Goals, in terms of talking about uh, climate change and uh, bringing our students to the United Nations to talk to experts, for example, in the climate change and uh, 
global warming uh, dialogue. So it's been a really interesting journey. And as a science teacher, um, it's been really interesting for me because it really expands not only what my students are doing, but it allows me to develop an even more unique perspective on my science curriculum. So we're going to talk about uh, two projects. The first one uh, we call Sandy Stories. And for those of you not in the United States, um, Superstorm Sandy um, was a hurricane that devastated most of a lot of the East Coast of the United States and greatly impacted the East Coast of the United States at the end of October in 2012. Um, a lot of the shoreline of New Jersey and Brooklyn, Queens, and Long Island was uh, devastated with a storm surge of up to 10 feet. Um, a significant number of people lost their lives. The city of New York was impacted greatly for many, many weeks. Many of our students were personally affected by Superstorm Sandy. Um, many of my friends and neighbors on Staten Island uh, were greatly impacted on, by Superstorm Sandy. So in thinking about my atmospheric science curriculum and talking to my students, they wanted to do something um, that would continue the relief services for um, Superstorm Sandy victims. And I can assure you that uh, even a year and a half later, there are still people that need our support. So what we decided to do as a class, and I threw this out to them and I said, you've come up with this idea that you want to do something for Sandy victims. Let's talk about what you'd like to do. So this is a project that was done in my senior class, Atmospheric Science. And again, it was a student-developed project. We spent the class period sort of brainstorming ideas about what we wanted to do for a project, um, the student's initial uh, idea was, you know, to do a fundraiser, some sort of a bake sale, something like that. And I sort of challenged them to think bigger and beyond that. So one of the students suggested that, you know, a lot has happened in the years since Superstorm Sandy. And it might be interesting to look at uh, Sandy neighborhoods one year later. So their first proposal was to do a book that would chronicle uh, Sandy neighborhoods one year later. So they would go back and find some pictures from just after Superstorm Sandy. And then they would go to those same locations and take pictures of those locations today. So I said, that sounds like a really great idea. Let's move on it. The students did a lot of research on um, photographs from the end of October of 2012. Um, they pinpointed those locations. They found some rather iconic ones. And they were they had mapped out on a Google map where they wanted to go to take their pictures. They had assigned people to take pictures within the class. Uh, one of the problems they really they ran into rather quickly was that a lot of the pictures that they wanted to use for their right after Sandy pictures were uh, copyrighted. And when they contacted organizations like the New York Times or um, the Guardian, uh, or other media outlets, they weren't too keen on giving up copyright uh, to uh, a group of students. So we had to reconsider what we were going to do. So we came back, we brainstormed again. Um, and the next thing we came up with was we were going to, students were going to take their iPhones and go to the neighborhoods that were affected and then interview residents there about their feelings about uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, one year later. So once they started to figure that out, they said, well, you know, the problem's going to be, it's going to be, unless we knew somebody in that neighborhood, it's going to be really challenging for us to find somebody that would be, one, willing to tell their story, and two, it's, you know, we may find nobody that's willing to tell their story and nobody that still live there. So after considering that one, they said, okay, we're going to put that one aside. And then they decided that they wanted to look inward. So what they did was they said, let's identify people within the school community that uh, were impacted by Superstorm Sandy and ask if they would be interested in telling their stories. So it involved a lot of collaborative planning. And that's what they settled on in the end was they wanted to do a book of stories of our faculty 
staff and students that were impacted by Sandy. So it also required a lot of sensitivity, as we'll talk about in a minute, about talking to people about their willingness to tell their stories. So one of the things I really liked about this project was that it really was the class was the one making the decisions about what they wanted to do. I just gave them a context for it and said, let's run with this. Um, students focused, focused on different sections of the book. So one group worked on the opening, one group worked on the climatology of it, one group worked on uh, the stories, one group, one group worked on all the documentation that had to go along with it. And they created their book and iBooks author on, the, on their uh, Mac laptops, um, which they've had experience bef with before. Uh, it's very easy to use, and the learning curve is very low. So we sort of went off with this, um, and then there was a lot of additional considerations. Um, and we have one question from Ness. Um, the book is available on the iTunes bookstore, which will, I'll show you that information um, in a moment. So in terms of additional considerations, first and foremost was picking the people that um, – we were going to have tell their stories. And this was really challenging because even a year later, people's emotions about the impact of Sandy were still very raw. So what we did was the students generated a list from their friends and talked to some teachers. And they went to the upper school head, the upper school principal, and she reviewed the email that the students wrote and she reviewed the list of names because she's privy to more information about students' backgrounds um, than I would be or the students would be. And what the students did was they had their email, they sent an email, and then they went and talked to the people individually about whether they'd be willing to participate in this or not. And we had out of the 10 people that we asked to do this, um, six of them said they would, and the other four um, chose not to do it. They also then had to decide if the person was going to contribute a video reflection or a written reflection to the book. And this was challenging um, specifically for one teacher whose apartment was completely destroyed by Superstorm Sandy. And she tried as she could to um, sit down in front of the video camera and tell her story, and she just could not do it. We had another student that just um, was her – she ended up moving about six times as a result of this. She also could not tell her story on video. So they both asked if they could do written reflections. And the students were very accommodating and said that that would be nice. And it ended up making a nice balance in the book because we had some video and we had some written words. Um, the students had to schedule um, a videotaping and editing sessions. They did all the videotaping of the student stories um, and the faculty stories. Um, and they did all the editing using just iMovie. The other thing that we had to work on was something our school has what are called CSC discussions, which stands for Challenge Shape and Change the World. And what we asked the participants in the um, that were contributing reflections, we asked them if they would be willing to tell their story to the rest of the school community. And we had five of them that were willing to do it publicly. And our first temptation was to just record those um, public reflections. And then the more the students thought about it, they said, you know, it's tough enough that they're going to have to get up in front of a group of other uh, students and faculty. We don't want to add the camera to it. And I will tell you that their reflections in a public forum were really transformative for the students. They were transformative for me because um, we got a lot more detail in the public forum than we did in, in the, the videotape one. We limited our videotapes, uh, videotaping sessions to just 90 seconds or two minutes. Um, but when we got our participants in the public forum, they were willing to talk for five or 10 minutes. So. Um, in some ways, uh, the students were glad that the camera wasn't part of that conversation. The other thing the students had to figure out was um, because the book was going to be sold on the books I bookstore, they had to apply for and obtain an ISBN number because that's required if you're going to sell a book. Um, 
and the school paid the $75 for the ISBN number, but they had to take care of um, all the paperwork for that. And the biggest challenge for them in terms of doing this book was because the book was going to be sold on the bookstore and there'd be money coming in, they had to have access to the school bank account. And it took a lot of time. It took close to a month for us to finally work with the business office to come up with a solution. And what the business office did was they created a special bank account for the students so that all the money um, that they collected from the sale of their book would go into that bank account. And then the money that they've raised is going to be donated to Catholic Relief Services in New York City to support um, ongoing Sandy Relief. So these were all issues that came up and, um, you know, I had pre, you know, prior knowledge about things like ISBN number and I would just sort of feed the kids and say, here's something you need to consider. You need to come up with a solution to it. And like I said, they were empowered to do all the problem solving themselves. So the components of the book, um, and again, different students, uh, groups of students worked on different parts. There was a uh, forward and dedication that the students wrote. Um, one group worked on storm climatology and sort of the background of the storm. Uh, one group worked on collecting the written reflections. One group worked on collecting the video reflections. And then we had students still that went out and took pictures, and uh, yours truly went out and took pictures as well as on Staten Island. Um, sort of one year later. They wanted these pictures for um, chapter uh, covers in the cup of the book. They did, in terms of the book cover itself, they did work with getting images in terms of purchasing and what they considered to be a really uh, interesting uh, book cover. And the book cover that they chose was an image of headlines from different newspapers um, from uh, from all over the country right after Sandy. So the school paid for the uh, copyright information, you know, the copyright fee for that to have uh, access to that. So the school had to invest a little bit of money on this, but in the end we knew that this was going to be a valuable exercise for the students. So the final book um, will not play in here because it's a little video. Um, I did sort of capture it, but um, it's a great, it's a great story. Um, like I said, that we have about six or seven independent stories, either written or um, visual. Um, in terms of assessment for this, the students did not get a grade. Um, this was a project that they worked on as a class. I thought about giving them an assessment, but my in the end, the question is, what was I going to assess? I could check off that they had completed all their tasks, but since we were working in a, a collaborative environment between teachers and students. Um, I didn't see any need to assess them, and quite honestly, they never, when I said to them, I said, do you want to get a grade on this? Most of them said no, because they were doing it just for their own, um, for their own reward, I guess would probably be the best way to say it. Um, the book is now available in the iTunes bookstore, both in the United States and it's available in Australia. Um, it's $5.99 US dollars, and if the, e I was going to put the link in here, but the, um, the link was way too long. So the easiest thing to do is if you go into the iBook store, the app store, um, and search Sandy Stories, you'll find the book there, and we would encourage you to buy it, and my students would encourage you to buy it as well. It, the other thing the students needed to do was they needed to promote the book and they needed to do some accounting. So they did some PR, um, and I, again, I let them work together in terms of figuring out what the best way was to promote their book. So on their personal Facebook pages, they each promoted the book, and they did, um, they worked with our director of communications um, to get information on the school website, the school Facebook uh, page and the school Twitter account. They've done um, two monthly blast emails to the school community to uh, promote their book as well. And they've done word of mouth and uh, I get to do the presentations on their book um, and get to talk about it to do some uh, additional PR. So they get uh, monthly sales reports. Um, when they, we first got the book on the bookstore in the beginning of January, 
Um, they wanted to check every day to see how many books they had sold, and I told them that if they did that, they would drive themselves crazy. So um, I've shown them how to access the sales reports, and they check monthly. So we just we're going to get our second report um, next week because it'll be two months from the bookstore. Their goal is, um, and I apologize for the misplaced comma. Uh, their goal is ten thousand dollars for Sandy Relief. They're not close to that now, but, you know, it's been a slow start for them, and that's one of the things they've learned is how they actually, um, what other kinds of PR they could do. Um, but they have been accessing and tracking the sales, so that's been an interesting experience for them. Um, and then one of the things they decided was because we have sister schools in the U.K., Mexico, Italy, France, and Portugal, that they're going to work to um, – get the book for sale in those countries as well on the bookstore. So um, the only thing that I did in terms of this was um, I'm the only one that has the bank account information um, because the school wasn't going to give it to students, and rightly so. Um, so my responsibility is just taking care of the bank account information, giving an accounting to the business office, and I uploaded the book to um, the bookstore. Everything else the students did, um, and they are – when the book was first announced on there, it was the first book the school had ever had on the bookstore. Um, they were thrilled because our students love it when they're the first ones to get to do anything. So it was a really great experience for them. Um, they think they want to do a second version of it, like a second edition. Um, but since our seniors are done, this is a senior class, since they're done um, really at the beginning of May, they're going to task next year's class to doing um, – a second edition of this and really sort of going outside and sort of doing Sandy two years later. Um, so that should be interesting to see um, how they plan out what next year's, what they want next year's book to see and what kind of challenge they're going to lay down for the following year's class. So um, I have to do my little PR thing. Um, please spread the word about the book. Please encourage your friends and family to buy it. Um, it all goes to a good cause. And that's the only PR I'm going to do for it, but I promise my kids I would do it for them. Um, the next project we're going to talk about um, comes from looking at um, design thinking, um, and let me just answer Gary's question. Um, we had considered putting the book on Kickstarter, um, or the students had, and while we thought that was an interesting idea, because the book doesn't um, cost us anything to produce. They decided not to put it on Kickstarter. However, I will share your idea with them again um, as another mechanism for getting support. Um, I think that's a great idea. And, you know, I'll, once they know that somebody else suggested it, I think that may have some uh, impact as well. So I appreciate your suggestion. I think it's a great one. So the second project that I want to talk to you about is one that's done in my honors physics class. Um, it's one that we started with this year. Uh, our school has two digital fabrication labs with 3D printers and um, vinyl cutters, laser cutters, um, and all sorts of fabrication devices. Um, so this was a project we've been talking a lot in our school about um, additional ways of assessing student understanding so that we're moving sort of beyond the test and letting students find additional ways to represent their knowledge and understanding. So in thinking about my honors physics class, one of the things I was thinking about is that, you know, as an honors physics class, they tend to be very test heavy. You know, we do what we do a unit, they have a test, we move on to the next unit. And what I wanted to think about was in what ways could I sort of broaden that assessment so that it didn't cover just one topic but covered many topics, but wasn't a pen and paper test. So in thinking about using our new digital fabrication lab at our Fifth Avenue building, one of the things that I thought about was um, how could I use that, that those, uh, the 3D printers as a, as a summative assessment when our students are studying uh, force excuse me, work and energy. So 
I, I laid down the challenge for them that I wanted them to design and construct a physics-based or a force-based solution to a local, regional, or global social justice issue. And I introduced this topic to them and the project to them the day before parent-teacher conferences. And the first response I got from them was sort of this look of confusion on their face that I'm not exactly sure why we're doing this or where this is going to take us. And I, some of the students looked at me and I had that look that was like, I really don't want to do this. And so I let it settle for them and I said, you know, I'm just going to lay out what I want you to do. I just want you to go home and think about it. I paired them up in groups of two. Um, actually, they paired themselves up. Um, and they paired themselves up based on when they had free periods together, which I thought was interesting. And that's so all I said to them. I gave them some a context about the Millennium Development Goals that, that have been challenged by the UN to really rethink a local, regional, or a global social justice issue, and sort of like, where can you take this? So the next day was parent conferences. And our parent conferences are unique in that both the parents and the students come. And I would say almost three quarters of them, when they came in for parent conferences, the first thing they said was, oh, me and my partner already have an idea of what we would like to do, which meant that they had gone and thought about it. Um, the excitement from the students was palpable. The excitement from the parents was palpable. Um, it was really great to see that they had thought about it, and they were more than willing to share some of their original ideas. So we did a lot of skill development with them in terms of uh, developing this project. Uh, we did a little tutorial for them about um, how to use a 3D printer, and we took um, 20 minutes of class time to do that. And then we taught, gave them a little bit of introduction to uh, something called Thingiverse, which has some pre-existing, uh, many, many pre-existing uh, 3D files on there. And um, what was interesting, all I said to them was, I said, I want you to find something on Thingiverse that you find interesting, that you think might be physics related, and just practice printing it out. So they got, I wanted to give them a little bit of practice about printing something and understanding sort of how effective the 3D printer could be. Um, we then did a little tutorial on Tinkercad. Um, Tinkercad is a web-based um, design program, and the files that you create in Tinkercad can then be exported and then printed on a 3D printer. So the first thing that they had to do was um, they had to do their preliminary designs on Tinkercad. The only thing that they ever told me was what they wanted a project to be, and I met with each group individually. They explained what social justice issue they were resolving, how physics was involved in that solution, and what they thought their original thought was on what that solution would be. That was pretty much how I laid it out for them. Once they had finished their Tinkercad designs, they shared them with me, and they had to have somebody peer review it. So this was their first design that they did. Another group looked at their design and said, based on what their social justice issue was and what the physics concept was, looked at the design and said, I think this is a really good idea, or you may want to tweak this, you may want to try uh, doing something else. We also went through the engineering design process, um, and student documentation, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but again, they had to really look at what the problem was, they had to identify the criteria, and what the constraints of their project were. They spent a lot of time, I gave them class time to do it, they spent time out of class. Um, they had to brainstorm a lot of possible solutions. They would come up with ideas. They, once they sort of focused in on what they wanted their approach to be, that's when they um, built their model or prototype. The interesting thing was that a lot of them thought once they had built their model or prototype that they were done. Um, and the last step was often the one that was skipped where they would refine their design. And in terms of that step, I would say about three quarters of the group went back, did another refining of their design, but they ran into a time issue with the 3D printers where there were 10 groups trying to all print out stuff at the same time. So um, 
that was the one thing I, I sort of let slide. I said, if you're, if you're happy with your design and you've printed it out once, you can sort of run with that. And they were sort of okay with that. Um, but they spent a lot of time after school um, during their free periods printing out their projects. Um, really interesting. So it was really important for them to also document what they did. So I used a website called Innovation Portal. And this is really a great, it's free. And as teachers, we like things that are free. Um, this is a really great website because what it does is it allows you to document all of your work, but document all of your work based on the engineering design process. So just before Christmas vacation, um, around December 20th, the students had to have this completed. Um, and then what they do is they work together on it, and then it gets shared with me. Um, and I can go through and review all their design processes as well. I was really careful, though, not to um, make critiques or suggestions while they were working through the design process. I would check their work as they went along, but I was very careful to not impinge on their design thinking because I really wanted them to resolve issues that they had as opposed to um, me giving them su suggestions. There were a couple of groups that wanted to do a couple of tricky things, um, and I'm going to show you one of the projects in a minute, where they asked for help for the, from the um, administrator of the fab lab. And it was something I didn't know how to do, but he, he knew how to do it, and he said, I'm more than willing to help. Um, that was a group that used, um, they used the Arduino um, to program. And as Gary mentions, the Raspberry Pi, also a great tool. Um, we're big proponents of using both of those um, and finding ways to, you know, integrate sensor work into them. So this was sort of their official documentation. This is what they got assessed on in this project primarily was how well did they document their project. So they had to include um, sketches of their own work, um, you know, over time, different iterations of it. And like I said, most of the groups had multiple designs. One group wanted to come up with a way to deliver electricity to remote areas in the Catskills. And no matter what they did, somebody had already come up with a solution for it. So their project transformed from delivering, and the group that they were working with um, works with um, children with disabilities and gives them sort of a, a fresh air fund experience. And their project transformed from delivering electricity to the homes that they use in the Fresh Air Fund out in the Catskills in New York, uh, transformed from that to designing a uh, computer desk, a movable and flexible computer desk for students that are, uh, and children that are bedridden. So it was interesting to see in which direction people would go. And I just sort of sat back and enjoyed the ride and watched them do the development themselves. Um, the other great thing was when they would have class time to work on this, um, I would facilitate, I'd walk around, I'd ask them how things were going, I'd ask them, um, you know, to sort of suggest things that they were working on. But the other great thing was that it was great to see that they were working with each other um, and that a group that sort of reached a dead end or, or a barrier would say to the group next to them, you know, we've gotten to this point, but we're not exactly sure what to do. And um, an example of that was a group that wanted to find a way to uh, compost um, hum human excrement in Africa as a fertilizer. And um, they were trying to find, they worked really, really hard in trying to find a way to deliver that um, compost to certain farms and how to make it a local solution. And um, I had no answer for them. And their peers, they worked with their peers and kept refining it, refining it, refining it until um, until they got um, they modeled it after a salad spinner. And that's all I'm going to tell you. Um, I'm not sure it's going to work, but they're going to see where it goes. So one of the other things, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of documentation, is um, each group was required to set up their own Weebly, and Weebly is a free uh, website uh, creating uh, soft. It's uh, online. And 
it's great because it's all drag and drop for the kids. So they had to, each group also um, publicly had to create a uh, Weebly to show their work. Um, innovation portal is private. I also wanted them to publicly document what they were doing. Um, and this goes through um, one of the things that Alan November always talks about, about students being global communicators and collaborators. So I also wanted them to have a mechanism by which they would share their work. Um, and that their peers could see what they were doing. So this is the Weebly, just a little screen capture from Aquify Kenya, and I'm going to show you what their project is um, in a moment. So as Gary mentions, um, documentation, really, really important, um, that we want our students to be documenting what they're doing. So what the students also had to do was they had to do a presentation. Um, three minutes, that's it. They had to describe what their social justice issue was. Um, how the solution solved the issue, what their design process was, and how physics was involved in the solution. And they had a panel of judges. Um, they had a design specialist. They had an upper school head, our upper school head, and the chair of our religious studies department. And they, there was a little rubric, a presentation rubric, um, that each judge got. And um, the judges had two minutes for follow-up questions. The interesting thing was that um, while the students stuck to the three minutes in length for their presentation, the judges had so many questions, um, good questions, that we usually we went over the two minutes for the follow-up question. But if you ask any of the judges about the quality of the work that the students did, they were blown away. Um, and we brought in the religious studies chair specifically to address the social justice aspect of it. Um, Again, we chose, we were going to record these, but again, we just thought we wanted the experience of the students doing their presentation. And their presentations, um, I'm always blown away by the work my students do, but these ones blow me away uh, twice as much. So I'm going to talk to you about three of the projects that the students did. The first one is called Aquify Kenya. And one of the problems, students for some reason always seem to go to water purification as a, as an issue and something that they want to solve. And I was happy to let them do that. Um, but I sort of told them, you know, try and think a little bit outside the box. So this group did a lot of research about water delivery in Kenya. And one of the things they found was that all of the water delivery pipes, and I had no idea this was true, all the water delivery pipes in Kenya all have the same diameter. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to come up with a way to deliver chlorinated water to people, but at a local level so that it's coming, it's coming out at the end of the pipe. So this design is it's a water filter, and it fits every pipe in Kenya. The outer rim has chlorine in it that will be, that's, that will be released on a regular basis to purify the water. And one of the questions the judges asked them was, well, is there going to be a point where you're going to get too much chlorine in the water? And from their research, one of the things they found is that adding a little bit of chlorine is better than not adding any chlorine at all. So um, this was a really interesting project. And again, this was printed on a 3D printer. Um, they didn't put the chlorine in it. Um, and right now they're working on testing to see if um, how they can best release the chlorine. Um, into the water. So um, that's what they're working on now. So a really interesting project, um, an interesting way to do water purification. But again, this was their own design. Um, so that's project number one. Project number two um, involved, uh, is called the Teddy Text. And this one involves Arduino programming. So one of the things the students uh, became aware of was that um, from a lot of stories in the news, that when there's emergencies in children's homes, they, you know, their tendency is to pick up the phone and they may not know how to use the phone. So what they designed was a teddy bear with an Arduino microprocessor in it so that when you squeeze the paw, and they, their first uh, focus was on students or children that were being abused, that if the child squeezed the paw, that a message would be sent to 911 that would say that there's abuse going on and actually would pinpoint the location of that abuse. So they actually did a little demonstration of it. And on the 
they had to learn how to program the Arduino to do that, to make the phone call, to do the text. And sure enough, the sample one that they texted said that there was um, child abuse going on um, at our school. Now, of course, um, it only went to the student's phone. It didn't go to 911. So in the course of having the conversation about this, um, and in the questioning that we were having, the students quickly figured out, because um, after Sandy Hook here, um, the shooting that took place at the elementary school, there's been a lot of discussion in schools about how do you report um, intruders in your school. So what the student decided to do is they said, well, you know what? We don't really have to limit this to um, child abuse. We can actually do this for schools, for classrooms, for specifically for elementary classrooms that call the teddy bear will call 911 if there's an intruder. Um, and so that's what they're going to work on. They're working on that and seeing, like, how much this is going to cost to produce and if it's feasible. The challenge is that the Arduino that goes, uh, Arduino costs $35. So they need to think of a way to get a lower cost um, microprocessor in there that will do, um, that will make the phone call. But again, they work with um, the Fab Lab director on how to do the programming, things like that. I thought it was a great idea. And the last one um, is another water, water purification um, example. Um, and this one's aimed directly at Zimbabwe. So one of the things that they do in Zimbabwe a lot is they play soccer. And one of the challenges for the people in Zimbabwe, and specifically the women in Zimbabwe, that live in remote areas is that they can spend up to three hours a day um, walking to obtain water and then walk back with that water. And there's no guarantee that they're going to get back to their home with the water. And this is a lot of the work that um, water.org has been working on. So um, what they designed was, and this is really innovative, and again, this is printed on the 3D printer. Um, it's a soccer ball that has a water filter in the middle of it so that when children are playing soccer, they can pour water into the soccer ball. And then the soccer ball will filter the water for them. If you separate the soccer ball at the end, um, you'll get about, from their calculations, about a gallon of water, which in the scheme of things in Zimbabwe, that's a very valuable thing to have. So. Um, this one they had a little bit of trouble with um, the filtering process in the middle. They worked with the chemistry teacher to look at some activated charcoal and things like that. But again, this is a group that thinks um, they think they're going to be um, they're looking to mass produce this as well. And most of the groups there were ten groups. Um, most of the groups are looking moving this forward. So that sort of begs the question: What are our next steps? Um, just to sort of take a step back in terms of assessments. The students were assessed two ways during this project. They were assessed uh, for their innovation portal and sort of documenting their work, and then they were assessed for their presentations. And, and really, that was it. So what they're working on now, uh, they're looking at uh, production cost analysis um, to see um, how much it's going to cost to produce their uh, items. Uh, some groups, and this is, I told them, I said, this is optional for if you want to do it. And about three groups have decided, you know what, we're happy with what we've done. We don't feel like this is something we want to move forward with. So, um, but seven of the groups are going to move forward. Um, they're going to develop their own marketing plan. Um, and then we have two ideas in terms of uh, funding this. Um, we're going to be working, hopefully, the students are going to be putting together their own Kickstarter campaigns to get funding for this. And then our other goal, and this comes from an educational consultant we're working with, um, suggested contacting Open IDEO, which does a lot of work uh, in the United States and globally on projects that resolve social justice issues. So um, we've just gotten in touch with them. So it's been a really interesting journey um, for the students. I asked the students when I saw them on Thursday you know, if there was something that I could, if there was something that they thought um, that was really sort of resonated with them that they would want me to share with you, 
one of the students said to me, she said, you know, this isn't what I would ever have considered doing in honors physics before. But she said, in the end, I think I learned more from this project than I would have if I just sat down and read the textbook. Um, and to have a student say something like that at the end of this kind of project, to me says, like, this has been something that's really resonated with them. And the fact that they're willing to carry on with this project um, just for their own interest and for their own desire to do it, um, to me is really, really, um, it's a really powerful learning experience. It also, I think, resonates with the fact that the school has always committed itself towards um, social justice and that they're seeing that social justice is not just limited to what they're doing in their ethics class or their religious studies class. So the one thing I will ask you is um, the three ideas that I shared with you here today, because they are prototypes and could possibly be funded that you're not share them with anybody. Um, but we will certainly let you know when there's opportunities to support them. Um, I'll share with you my uh, contact information. And then at the bottom, what I've done is I've put all of their projects um, on a Weebly itself um, and all the guidelines for uh, the work we did in putting together the Sandy book, all the background information for um, the design projects. All of their design projects are actually there. Um, and all their student presentations are there as well and links to their own personal Weebly. So you can use all of that. Um, as I always say, um, I'm not proprietary. Um, if you want to use this information, if you want to recreate um, this project in your own class or either these projects in your own class and you need assistance, just send an email. I'm more than happy to help. Um, and I hope you do because I think this, for me as a teacher, um, this was really transformative as well. And I, I was so glad that I took the time to do this project. And to see the response that my students had to it was really, really powerful for me as a teacher as well. So looking at the clock, it's um, almost 10 o'clock here in New York City at night. Um, but we have about five minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, you can certainly type them into the chat box. Um, and I'm happy to respond um, to your questions. And I thank Gary for his um, thoughtful commentary during the chat. I hope I was able to answer. Um, all of your questions while you were while we were going through the discussion. Yeah, it looks like Gary all of Gary's questions have been answered. Um, I found that really interesting because for me, I guess not being a physics teacher, I I, I was sort of at some points wondering how they're projects linked back to physics. Um, but then I you know, thought about, about it a little bit more and went, well, physics isn't just about um, things moving and all of that sort of stuff. It's a lot more. So I was, I was, it took me a little while to connect with how, how they were linked to physics. But I think the way you've linked with social justice issues is fantastic. It's a real world problem that needs to be Thank solved. You. And, you know, to be honest, too, some of their connections to physics initially were rather circumspect, um, but they all came around to it. You know, one group redesigned, um, and I didn't show these, one group redesigned bicycle frames for specifically for roads in Kenya because the roads there were so awful. Um, so they, that was one of their projects. Um, another group had another way of growing food in urban areas, and the physics involved in that was looking at how you would move one part to another. Um, and the third group did, um, one of the students, her mother works at an urban garden in part that um, usually hosts um, people with disabilities. And one of the issues in the park was that they had a staircase that had no ramp to it, but then they couldn't afford to um, like redesign the park. So the students came up with a movable, flexible ramp that could be moved over the staircase and then moved out of the way right away. So, um, you know, there were some stretches, um, but and it really some of it went beyond what I'd asked them to do in terms of physics, work, and energy. And I was on it. I was fine with that. I was like, you know, if you want to run with this, 
And in this direction, I'm not going to hold you back. All right. So it doesn't look like there's any more questions from the audience. So thank you very much once again, Eric, for your fantastic awesome. presentation. I think the real world application um, is something that every teacher could learn from. So thank you very much. You're welcome.